Hi, and welcome to our daily devotion from St. Swithin's Church, Pimble. Let's pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for this new day. Thank you that your love for us is new every morning. We pray that you would give us our daily bread today. Please speak to us through your word that we might be strengthened spiritually. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, today we're looking at the first half of chapter 15 of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Paul starts this new section talking about a crucial but fairly straightforward sequence of events. Paul preached the gospel, the Corinthians received or believed it, and they'd taken their stand on it. But it seems they have become a little shaky in that stand they have taken. They're being tempted to move away from Paul's original message. And so Paul writes to remind them of the true gospel and that they must hold firm to it to be saved. Doing otherwise, he warns, would mean that they believed in vain. In verse 3, Paul says, For what I received, I passed on to you. Received and passed on are terms often used uh, of those who carefully passed on what they learned from their teachers. They in turn expected those who heard them to continue to pass on the information. Nowadays, we'd probably record such information in a computer's memory. But back then, the information was recorded in the human memory of people who had cultivated their memories over time and with skilled practice. This oral tradition we read about in verses 4 to 7 then goes back to the earliest experiences of Jesus's followers. We're fortunate today to have God's word written uh, in written form. However, we still have a receiving and passing on role to play. We have received the gospel and it's our job to pass it on just as, as it is. The trouble is, though, that we're always under pressure to change it to suit ourselves. And what I think Paul is saying in effect here, or what he would say to us is, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And that's why, like us, Paul's readers needed to be reminded of what the gospel actually was. In doing so, Paul wants to avoid getting bogged down in peripheral matters. So he cuts to the chase uh, by, rem by reminding them of what is of first importance. And it turns out that the key aspects of that are very familiar to us because they've become part of the creeds we regularly use in our church services. And that is how it should be, because our creeds were designed to summarise for us what is of first importance in our faith. So what exactly is of first importance? What exactly is the main thing that we should keep the main thing? Well, here's what Paul says in verses 3 and 4. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scripture. Now, often when we talk about the resurrection, we point to the empty tomb as being the crux of the matter. But Paul focuses on something else. For him, it seems it was more important to talk about who witnessed the resurrection. As many, of, uh, many writers of the time did, Paul appeals to witnesses from whom their hearers could inquire. It's like he's saying to his readers, you don't just have to take my word for it. You can check it out with these guys. What follows then is like a list of people Paul would call to the witness box in an investigation. First to take the stand is Peter, then the 12, then the more than 500 of the brothers and sisters who saw the risen Jesus at the same time. I am throwing in the number 500 
just in passing, Paul throws out the argument that the people who claim to have seen Jesus risen from the dead were hallucinating. Everyone knows that 500 people don't experience the same hallucination at the same time. And anyway, Paul adds, most of them are still living. And so again, you can check it out with them for yourselves. Next on the list of witnesses is James. James is the Lord's brother, according to Galatians chapter 1, verse 19. Next to the witness box are all the apostles. And here Paul is using a wider designation than simply the twelve. One would often conclude a list like this with the words, and last but not least, Paul adds himself last to the list, but describes himself as the least of the apostles, not even deserving to be called an apostle because he persecuted the church of God. Paul had publicly and brutally persecuted the church in living memory. And yet here he is, only a few years later, preaching the very same message he had been so zealous to eradicate. His testimony must have left his peers and countrymen asking themselves, what happened to turn this guy around so completely, so radically? Whatever it was, it must have been powerful. Paul then goes on to put his case for the second installment of resurrection, the resurrection of believers. It seems there was some dispute going on. Some of the Christians in Corinth were calling into question the future resurrection of believers. Uh, like speakers of his day often did, Paul starts with common ground, but then moves on to reduce his opponent's case to the absurd showing that it leads to conclusions that not even his opponents would accept. The common ground he finds is the undisputed fact that the past resurrection of Jesus is an established fact and the very foundation of their faith. But from there, he goes on to, uh, he goes on to point out the fact that that is simply the first installment. The second installment is the future resurrection of believers. And the two installments cannot be separated. Paul repeats the word if multiple times to reinforce his points. Reading from verse 13, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. Your faith is useless. Verse 15, we are false witnesses. Verse 17, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Verse 18, those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Verse 19, and we of all people are most to be pitied. Then in verse 32, he says this, if the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. He goes on to say, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. Sobering words and words which we do well to reflect on. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. We praise and thank you that he was raised on the third day. We think, thank you that we have a saviour who has risen and ascended into glory. And we look forward to his coming again in glory. We pray, please, that you would strengthen our faith, keep us in the hope that we have received, and help us to keep the main thing the main thing and bring us to eternal life. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us this morning. Hope to see you next week. God bless.